Good evening and welcome to this session. We have three speakers today, but I must inform you of a slight change since Michael show did not come in Brazil. Our first speaker is Irene Dacia, who is Associate Professor in Classics at the Institute of Classical Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies of Tbilisi State University. She's going to speak about rethinking Plato's Fido using digital meters. Well, making a lexical 
statistical analysis, the first step is to prepare a corpus for investigation. In my case, it could be a full text of Plato's Phaedo, but in order to make observation on lexical, that is, stylistic and conceptual peculiarities of Plato's dialogues, different parts, it's important to have a structured corpus. So, in the beginning, I'll try to present my view on Phaedo's structure. One can see that according to the development of the action in Phaedo, nine parts can be distinguished, and a certain regularity is obvious. Only a few characters figure in the work. Phaedo, whose narration is the basis of the whole creation, Ephecrates, who sometimes appears as a participator of the dialogue with Phaedo and sometimes as a passive listener. Uh, Socrates himself, who actually holds a philosophical dialogue and proves the soul's immortality, both from the philosophical and the mythological point of view, or tries to prove it at least. Simeas and Cebes, who take part in the philosophical dialogue directly. Crito, the guard, the Xantipe, Socrates V, who appears only episodically in Pedro's so called descriptive parts. Uh, the development of the action is actually determined by the interchange of these characters. They are changing, and the scene is changing accordingly. Uh, the conversation comes to the action, the action to the discussion, and vice versa. Sometimes we listen to the dialogue taking part in Athens or in Phoebus. Sometimes we watch the actions of the philosopher and his friends. The structure consisting of nine parts is made by the interchanging of these three scenes. Actually, the play is performed before our eyes, where the scene of three types succeed each other. But by what sequence and principle do they interchange? If you consider each scene as an element of the work structure, and if you construct the scheme using them, we'll be able to clear up the principle by which structural elements are distributed. Let's mark each type of picture or each scene with the letters A, B, C accordingly. Part A. Pero, the secret is that is participating with this exposition to interludes and conclusion. B. The description of Socrates' actions in prison before and after the philosophical dialogue, uh, the so called descriptive part. C. The philosophical dialogue between Socrates and his friends the so-called dialogue part. The unity of A, B, and C elements makes a structure with nine parts. A, exposition, the first conversation of Phaedo and Hecates, which consists of 4,517 characters. B, Socrates in prison before the uh, philosophical dialogue, 2,298 characters. The beginning of Socrates and his friend's philosophical dialogue, 66,308 uh, uh, characters. Interlude, the second conversation of Phaero and Ephecrates, uh, which consists of 1,261 characters. Uh, C, the continuation of Socrates and his friend's philosophical dialogue, 27,203 characters. A, interlude, the third conversation of Phaero and Ephecrates, the comments of the second part of the philosophical dialogue, uh, 459 characters. C. Uh, the end of Socrates and his friend's philosophical dialogue, 31,461 characters. C. Conclusion. Socrates' last hour spent in prison after the philosophical dialogue, 4,831 characters. And finally, A. Last words to Epictetus, 884 characters. As we see, the monolithic structure is made by the following repetition. Element A four times, element B twice, element C three times. Element A as the exposition, two interludes and the conclusion make a certain prop in the structure. Uh, element A unites the whole dialogue, but at the same time breaks up the so-called dialogue part itself, which I've marked C, which is represented by a triad according. Uh, by element C, inserted at the beginning and the end of the structure, the spirit of symmetry is created, which is increased by elements C and A, rhythmically interchanging in the, in the structure. 
the so-called Bernard part of two interludes, that is interchanging of the C and A elements, um, the whole complex, C, A, C, A, C, makes a second center, around which the A and B elements are symmetrically placed, and this uh, structure is counterbalanced by them. A certain mixture of parallel division and circle symmetry is presented to the dialogue part itself by the interchanging of philosophical discussion and interviews. Um, there's a question. What is the length correlation between the structure-making elements? The beginning of Socrates and his friend's philosophical dialogue, C1, exceeds its continuation, C2, and the end, three, uh, C3, twice over, and the, the other parts are nearly near the same length. Using outcome, I did some changes in my older observations. In my dissertation and in my monograph, which I published uh, in 1998, I was writing that the exposition, A1, also outnumbered the interviews having the same quantity, A2 and A3. <coughs> and the conclusion, A4, which presents a shorter element. But now, Using ANCOM, I have updated more accurate data. The exposition also outnumbered the interludes. In the conclusion, the element C, that is interlude, the third conversation of Philo and Hecrates, presents the shorter elements. As we see, the description of Socrates' actions and everyday details is given twice as much space after the philosophical dialogue than before it. The length of the dialogue part itself is about nine times greater than the total size of the other elements, which underlines the general peculiarity of the work once more, the main role of the discussion dialogue. As the analysis shows, uh, Plato provides the unordinary and complicated structure with its props, uniting and counterbalancing elements. The circle symmetry and parallel division principles are provided at the same time. A kind of mixture is given here. The center of the structure is a whole complex of the elements distributed by the circle symmetry and parallel division principles, C, A, C, A, C. One of the elements, A, appears as a crop of the whole structure. At the same time, around this circle, the A and B elements are distributed according to the circle symmetry. There is a close content, semantic and emotional connection between the passages of Philo, that is between the structure-making elements. The structure of Philo can be imagined as a pattern, pattern and its constituting threads are closely connected to each other by the peculiar rule characteristic of its pattern only. Neither phrase nor an episode can be tamed or shifted without destroying the composition pattern. Each passage arises from the foregoing one and inevitably needs the next one as well. Each episode continues the previous one and paves the way for the next passage. At the same time, there is a logical connection within each fragment. Let's see which are the lexical peculiarities of each structural part of the dialogue and how they are connected to the concept of each division. According to Lawrence Anthony, which is the author of the software Arncom, which I already mentioned, one of the first things what a user will do when analyzing a new corpus is to generate a list of all the words in the corpus. Great lists are useful as they suggest interesting areas for investigation and highlight problem areas in corpus. According to the study done using the Arncom, Plato's spiral consists of 4,902 word types, 22,699 word tokens. But this list includes all lexical formatives. The most frequently used word is chi, used uh, 1,322 times. This is the software, and you see the um, frequency of different formatives used in the dialogue. And in the beginning, it's chi. Of course, we should refine our search, we should concentrate on, let's say, meaningful words. Therefore, we should create and apply a so-called stop list, which will help us to avoid counting the words which are not of special interest for us. 
The law as Anthony argues, usually it is important to use a stop list to avoid counting high frequency function words when generating a word list. So I made a stop list which included all kinds of articles, particles, pronouns, but, but. It should be mentioned that the study of using the particles and pronouns by Plato is extremely challenging and could result in some outstanding observations. Mm, but this type of research is uh, out of my scope today, of course. After using the stop list, I got quite a different picture. 4,290 word types and 9,459 word tokens. The most frequent 10 tokens in Plato's uh, Fido are as follows. Ethe, 244, Enai, 216, Ebes, 82, Kuto, 65, uh, Socrates, 65, Doge, 57, Estin, 50, Ethe, 50, 246, Lege is 43, and Soma also 43. We should know that I just listed the most frequent forms and the, the real frequency of the words should be found including all possible grammar forms of each lexical formative. Why these words and not the others? Before I proceed with some additional data, it should be mentioned that the most frequent words are very much connected to the essence of Plato's work we are discussing. Then, to say it's a dialogue, a night to be, it's a crucial word in general. Uh, two personages will speak more than others. In this way, Kutos, this dialogue is a kind of explanation. Doge, I think it's interesting. Nobody is sure, they just express their opinion. Ethel, to have, it has a crucial um, grammatical and not only grammatical function. And level, to speak. The literary work is a dialogue consisting mainly from speeches. And finally, Suhe and Soma, soul and body. The dialogue is about the immortality of the soul, about the death, that is, about separation of the soul from the body, about the relationship of body and soul. Today, I will deal with just several words, soul, body, and death. In the beginning, I will use a concordance tool, the main purpose of which is to show how a search term is used in a target corpus, and for users who want to see where a search term appears, Underwood offers a composite search term plot tool, so we are able to detect automatically the use of the roots psu and so uh, in our whole corpus. So uh, here you see uh, the word psu in different contexts, in different parts of the dialogue and of uh, the structure. Well, here is uh, different uh, st the structural parts of the di dialogue as proposed by me in the beginning. This is about Suhe. And here you see the same word Soma. And also distribution of Soma in different uh, structural parts of the dialogue. As we see, the root Suh appears in the following words. Suhem, Suhem, Suhai, Suhem, Suhas, Suhem, Suhai, Suhai, Suhas, Suhomena, Suhestai, Suhoito. And it appears 150 times. The concordance plot tool enables us to see the distribution of this word in different structural parts of the dialogue. Suhai appears in the following parts the beginning of Socrates and his friend's philosophical dialogues 80 times. Interview, the second conversation of Phaedo and Hecrates, the comments of the first part of the philosophical dialogue twice, the continuation of Socrates and his friend's philosophical dialogue 37 times, the end of Socrates and his friend's philosophical dialogue 30 times, conclusion Socrates' last hour spent in prison after the philosophical dialogue just once. As concerns uh, the Soma, uh, we should deal with the token SOM or SOMA. Mm. Uh, the SOMA appears 105 times and we get the following results. At the beginning of Socrates and his friend's philosophical dialogue 81 times. The continuation of Socrates and his friend's philosophical dialogue 15 times. And in the end of Socrates and his friend's philosophical dialogue 9 times. Uh, the words connected to death, about Nesco and Selectao, could be also analyzed using the Ankh. 
the following morphological forms have been used by Plato in the text. Abotanontos, abotanoi, abotanonto, abotanein, abotanusi, abotanon, abotneske, abotneskoi, abotneskontas, abotneskonti, abotneskontos, abotneske, abotano. Teleutan, teleuton, teleutonta, teleutesanta, teleutesanton, teleute, teleutesanti, teleutesasi, teleuteson, teleuta, teleutontes, teleutosa, teleutekosi, teleutekotas, teleutekotes, teleutokoto. Teleut, teleutau is used 33 times, and abotnesko 39 times. They are distributed in a different way. Why and how a wood teleut and abot appear in different parts of the dialogue? Is the distribution of the specific words somehow connected to the concept of each part? Let's see. Exposition. The first conversation of Philo and Hecrates. Apocnesco twice, the left thou just once. Socrates in prison before the philosophical dialogue, the left thou once. The beginning of Socrates and his friend's philosophical dialogue, Apocnesco 31, the left thou 15 times. Interlude, the second conversation of Phaedo and Hecrates, Apocnesco just once. The continuation of Socrates and his friend's philosophical dialogue, Apocnesco twice, the left thou nine times. The end of Socrates and his friend's philosophical dialogue, Apocnesco 3, the left thou four times. And at the end of Socrates and his uh, and philosophical dialogue, Abotnesco three times, the Lotau four times. Conclusion, the Lotau just once, and in the last verse to effect at this, just twice. Well, just a uh, small final observation. The Abot is used more than the other one, but there is one peculiarity. Both terms appear in the philosophical parts of the dialogue. Abotnesco appears 37 times in this context, while the Lotau just 84, 88, 28 times. If known for philosophical context, we see Apocnesco only twice, while the Teleutau is used in such cases five times. So in Pino, the word Apocnesco is more related to the philosophical and religious topics than the word Teleutau. Unfortunately, I don't have time to deal with the, to say a few words about another uh, digital method about tree banking, but I may refer to these methods during the discussion. Thank you. I'm not a historian of philosophy. I've managed to sneak into this great conference thanks to my wife, who is a historian. But I, I have a few questions about um, the, the method, the natural language processing method that uh, you are using here. I actually have two or three questions, but let me start with the first one. So I take it that this algorithm, the algorithm, is purely semantical, that is to say, it's purely statistical and language blind, right? And so, when you talk about the grammatical forms, um, you introduce them by hand. So you uh, you actually uh, take care of all the uh, numerous forms on top of the pure statistics that the algorithm generates. Okay. Well, mm. I will, I, well, I will answer uh, uh, after all the questions. It's the, only this question. Uh, yeah, I have one more, which is yeah. brief. Um, so you mentioned the project, uh, the next project is to produce an aligned translation, and by aligned you mean sentence by sentence, right? So um, I would be curious to know if in addition to aligning the sentences there will be any uh, substantial um, alignment uh, which would, would take into account the, the actual rules, um, the ancient Greek or the other language. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, while using uh, Ankong, uh, you need to do uh, philological work. It's a big task, it's a huge task. You should uh, find out uh, different morphological forms. But if you see, uh, this software gives you a very good possibility. Unfortunately, I don't have a uh, to see uh, the roots in different contexts. So the software helps you very much to identify 
all possible forms. Of course, it's not very helpful with the verbs, but in this case, you should, be, you should use your philological knowledge. There is another tool, which I will, another software, which is uh, done in um, uh, the in Tufts University. This is a part of Big's uh, personal digital library project. Uh, it's a Persates and uh, it has a special uh, software of tree banking and uh, you can see now the, uh, on uh, the screen. Well, in this case you have a corpus, you have each sentence and this software uh, gives you a possibility to identify uh, each morphological form. It gives you different options and you just choose from different options. And in this case, by using tree bank, you uh, have all morphological forms, all syntactical forms, and you have a possibility to have such uh, dependency <coughs> trees, so-called. And in this case, it's possible to uh, make a very detailed syntactical analysis as well. So for philological re uh, purposes, this uh, tool is more effective, but is much more challenging and time-consuming. And you can, uh, using these two different softwares, you may reach different uh, results. So, uh, in order to make a philological analysis of the text, using you need both of them. One for more statistics, which can be used for your purposes, and this is for uh, deeper morphological and syntactical analysis. Well, as concerns the aligned translations, uh, this is more or less doable for European languages. It's a big challenge for Georgian, uh, which is uh, Caucasian, one of the Caucasian, uh, Caucasian languages, which has uh, quite different structure from European languages. So, mm -hmm. in the, while making alignment translation, uh, you, it, it, it gives you possibility uh, to understand better and deeper of the text, uh, its connection with your grammar, with your own structure, uh, and to identify um, uh, some uh, semantic uh, details which you can't identify just, you know, it's, uh, it's more difficult to identify. So it helps you to make more precise translation. <coughs> and it's very good uh, in the class while teaching. For example, I started to use tree bank methods uh, while uh, teaching ancient Greek texts to, to my uh, students, which are uh, classical philologists. And uh, they don't make more morphological or syntactical analysis on paper anymore. They do it uh, in uh, on the software and the computer. And also, while translating, they use this alignment method, which helps them to uh, study ancient Greek uh, more deeply not easier, but better. Thank you so much. I just wanted to ask, um, how do we have any criteria to distinguish the non-philosophical parts of the dialogue from the philosophical parts of the dialogue? And uh, related to this question, um, do you think that Plato has a firm terminological Sorry, what? A, a terminological usage of mm -hmm. words that we can use to that we can discern the meaning of the text. Well, uh, actually, uh, this uh, division uh, is of different uh, identification of different structures is based on based on the content content of the dialogue. Uh, it's more or less conventional. And of course, uh, the last, well, the part where uh, some actions replace, I name it as non-philosophical, but it's conventional, of course. And the parts in which uh, we hear the discussion about soul and body, about art, the different arguments about immortality, I name these parts conventionally, of course, uh, philosophical parts, in order just to have a structured picture of uh, the dialogue uh, in order to have a corpus, in order to make lexical analysis uh, and to understand the distribution of this or that work in different parts. So it's just conventional. Uh, uh, 
Hello. Uh, I have just one question. Maybe I'm sorry. Maybe I missed something. I arrived a bit uh, later. Uh, could you say something about the recomposition in, uh, uh, based on your research? Uh, about what? Ring composition of Plato's uh, dialogues uh, that they are like circles, you know. Ah, yeah. So he's turning around. Uh, and yeah. Uh, yeah, could you tell us something? Well, uh, very. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite, quite uh, it's a methodology. Uh, well, it used for uh, the Homer's uh, poems. Uh, by some scholars, uh, by my supervisor, uh, by Professor Portesiani, and uh, his uh, monograph on uh, the uh, structural analysis of Homer's point was very popular uh, in post-Soviet countries and also in Germany. It's, it was published in Germany. Well, and uh, it's uh, a methodology driven from uh, this, from that research. And I use the terms which are usually used for a geometrical uh, period. You know, it's, uh, well, you see the distribution, C, A, C, A, C, you know, it's a parallel division, you know, it's, uh, well, and when you see that there are different parts, for example, A, uh, A, then B, uh, and then again A, we see that, uh, we say conventionally as well that it's a, uh, circle sign symmetry, you know, that's the center, and uh, they have some uh, a parallel or similar parts from the beginning and in the end. Time is over. Thank you very much. The second speaker is Nicola Calcano, he's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Sao Paulo. His research is focused on a tetralogy of non-being in ancient philosophy. The stages of this tetralogy are non-being in Parmenides, Melissus, Gorgias and Plato's Sophist. He is going to speak in Italian about Socrate e Anassagora, vecchie risposte e nuove domande. naturalistica dei presocratici, e in particolar modo di Anassagora. Nel famoso passaggio che comincia in 96a, Socrate rifiuta l'investigazione fisica, Fisius Storia, e racconta che, avendo sentito dire di Anassagora, che spiegava tutti i fatti del cosmo con l'azione del Nus, si interessò a questo autore e ne lesse avidamente tutti i libri. Purtroppo però non ne rimase soddisfatto. Il discorso di Socrate propone argomenti inquietanti. Anzitutto rifiuta le spiegazioni che noi oggi chiameremmo riduzionistiche, cioè quello, quelle che tendono a ridurre al minimo possibile i fattori causali. Poi non solo introduce una teleologia facendo intervenire un proposito come causa del fatto, ma introduce specificamente una teleologia eticamente orientata, quindi introduce anche una teologia. Questa impostazione è certamente molto lontana dal pensiero di Anassagola e in genere dal pensiero presocratico, con una sola eccezione che anche vedremo. Socrate stesso lo riconosce quando dice che nella ricerca delle risposte alle sue preoccupazioni non aveva trovato soluzioni soddisfacenti negli studi di altri autori dovendo iniziare una ricerca per proprio conto della famosa seconda navigazione. Tuttavia, le metodologie sviluppate dai presocratici, anche se a prima vista lo, lo potrebbero sembrare, non erano certamente riduzionistiche, per cui ciò che Socrate sembra esigere è un certo tipo di spiegazione causale, abbastanza complesso, implicando addirittura una causa teologica tanto per il fatto specifico quanto per il tutto, 
è che si può considerare come sconosciuta dai presocratici. Questi infatti, secondo le poche testimonianze che abbiamo, si preoccupavano con un tipo di spiegazione che era sì alla radice di tutte le cose, ma che non era riduzionistica nel senso attuale del termine. Per loro la spiegazione soddisfacente avrebbe dovuto essere fornita da uno o più principi universali, arche o arca. L'arche non era causa del mondo nel senso che Socrate sembra esigere, l'arche era un principio che noi oggi potremmo chiamare di principio strutturale. La differenza tra causa e struttura non è piccola e allo stesso tempo non è immediatamente chiara. Se si vuole usare l'esempio dato da Socrate dello stare seduti, quando egli dice che la causa che gli rifiuta è la contrazione dei muscoli e la posizione delle ossa, egli pone come effetto questa causa, lo stare seduti. Dunque una causa fisica avrebbe uno, un effetto anch'esso fisico. Ma il principio perché ricercato dai presocratici non era la causa di un effetto, ma una spiegazione soggiacente tanto a causa quanto a effetto. Per fare un esempio moderno, rimanendo nella fisica, la causa della caduta di un sasso è la forza di attrazione reciproca tra il pianeta Terra e il sasso. Invece la struttura, la fisica, è la legge di gravitazione universale. Ma non è difficile confondersi e dire che la causa della caduta è la legge di gravitazione universale. Così, come la legge di gravitazione descrive un comportamento fisico ma non è essa stessa un comportamento fisico, così anche la che voleva spiegare comportamenti fisici ma non era essa stessa un comportamento fisico. Nel mondo presocratico la che è certamente un principio intelligibile, anche se in alcuni casi riceve nomi di enti fisici come acqua o aria, in altri casi riesce a svestirsi della fisicità come nell'arpedo o nel numero, o nell'essere nell e nel non essere, o come nel caso preso in considerazione da Socrate nel nus di Anassata. Quindi Socrate, quando si mostra insoddisfatto, non è perché la, è la spiegazione fisica ad essere insoddisfacente, dato che la proposta dei presocratici già conteneva una spiegazione intelligibile, piuttosto egli sembra insoddisfatto della stessa impostazione del problema, che mi sembra che era per lui insufficiente. Questo tipo di problematica non nasce con Socrate, infatti era già in chiaro sviluppo nei presocratici, ma Socrate sembra avvertire un insieme di problemi che cominciano a stagliarsi all'orizzonte proprio a partire dallo sviluppo del pensiero presocratico. Infatti, parallelamente ad accentuarsi del naturalismo dei pluralisti, specialmente con il pedocle e della sua influenza nella medicina, vediamo svilupparsi nel relativismo della sofistica che svuota il senso di principio universale, naturale e oggettivo come era l'arche, riconducendolo ad un accordo fra soggetti come per esempio vediamo in protagonista. In questo quadro sembra perdere chiarezza proprio quella che era la preoccupazione iniziale di questi pensatori, e cioè la spiegazione del nascere e del perire. In altre parole, di fronte all'esplosione della problematica e dei risultati delle ricerche sulla natura fatte dai presocratici, ciò che sembra perdere nitidezza è proprio la domanda iniziale. Come spiegare il nascere e il perire delle cose? Infatti, come vedremo meglio nel testo platonico, Socrate comincia con la tradizionale preoccupazione sul nascere e il perire, ma subito gli aggiunge prima di tutto un presupposto completamente nuovo, la necessità di una spiegazione che potremmo chiamare teologica e poi l'insoddisfazione con le risposte perché esse, non perché esse siano sbagliate ma perché non sono più sufficienti perché non rispondono completamente alla sua nuova necessità di spiegazione cioè non rispondono più alle nuove domande Il racconto di Socrate comincia con una dichiarazione della sua passione giovanile, l'indagine dell'arte. Della descrizione da lui data voglio mettere in risalto la prima parte, che è epistemologica. Per coloro che si dedicavano alla perificio di storia, conoscere significava conoscere le cause di ciascuna cosa. 
ciò corrisponde anche alla descrizione del conoscere che ce ne fa Aristotele nella metafisica, insomma corrisponde allo spirito antico sin dai tempi omerici dove conoscere qualcosa significa essenzialmente conoscere le cause di quel qualcosa le cause nel pensiero presocratico presocratico, presocratico qui nel senso stretto proprio prima di Socrate prima che Socrate mettesse in discussione qui nel fedone il concetto di gente di causa le cause dicevo nel pensiero presocratico e nel pensiero medico in genere consistono principalmente nelle cause efficienti e più precisamente nel senso del realismo in genere nelle genealogie di ciascuna cosa. Dopo questo inizio, la passione per la conoscenza delle cause di ciascuna cosa e di tutte le cose, Socrate continua e racconta come quel tipo di studio non gli fosse congeniale e che anzi alla fine sembrava che ne sapesse meno di prima. A riprova abduce vari esempi dei problemi a cui si dedicava e dei quali cercava di capirne le soluzioni. Per esempio se la crescita avviene per aggiunta di nutrienti, è in questi nutrienti che bisogna cercare la chiave per capire le funzioni del corpo, come il pensare. Quindi il pensare sarà una funzione dei nutrienti, e cioè del sangue, oppure come dicono altri, di altri elementi come aria o fuoco. E seguendo, dice Socrate, si passa dal pensare all'opinione e alla conoscenza. Tuttavia questo tipo di spiegazioni causali non gli sembrano verosimili. Infatti nel fenomeno della crescita, il piccolo prima della crescita e il grande dopo la crescita non sembrano originarsi l'uno dall'altro. In un altro esempio ci spiega che il 2 non è più grande dell'uno perché all'unità si aggiunge un'altra unità e né il 2 qualcosa di composto di uno più uno, infatti prese due unità, se sono separate sono ciascuna una unità, ma se vengono messe insieme allora sono due. Socrate afferma di non capire la causa di questa dualità. Sarà perché sono messi insieme le due unità? Sarà per altro motivo? O ancora peggio, in un altro esempio, evidenziando quella che sembra essere una contraddizione. Se si aggiunge una unità o un'altra unità, si dice che sono due, ma se si prende qualcosa e lo si taglia a metà, anche in questo caso si dice che sono due. Sono due unità. Dunque, com'è possibile che aggiungendo, moltiplicando per due diremmo noi, e tagliando, dividendo per due diremmo noi, si ottiene lo stesso risultato se aggiungere e tagliare sono operazioni opposte. Socrate si dichiara ben lungi dal capire. Ecco allora che, avendo sentito parlare di Anassagora, si decide a leggerne i libri. Che cosa lo spinse a questo? Dalle sue parole sembra che il motivo principale sia anzitutto il fatto di riuscire a trovare una spiegazione unica per tutte le questioni ormai ingarbugliate in mille possibili spiegazioni di uno stesso fenomeno. Ma poi, e questo ce lo dice lo stesso Socrate, il fatto che questa unica spiegazione fosse un nus, un principio non materiale che potesse, come un Dio che decide, mettere in ordine tutte le cose, dell'uomo, del cielo e della terra. Per meglio capire le sue motivazioni dovremmo scendere in alcuni particolari del testo. Cito. Ma udito una volta un tale leggere da un libro, come gli diceva di Anassagora, e dire che c'è dunque una mente ordinatrice e causa di tutte le cose, io mi rallegrai di questa causa e mi pare, secondo il mio modo, che questo porre la mente come causa di tutto convenisse perfettamente. E pensare, se la cosa è così, vuol dire che questa mente ordinatrice ordina tutte le cose nel loro insieme e ognuna dispone singolarmente nel modo che per essa è il migliore. Socrate racconta cosa si aspettava dalla sapienza di Anassagora a partire dal sentito dire dell'amico. Quello che sembra attrarre di più è la nozione di Gnus, ma prima di parlarci di Anassagora, egli, Socrate, ci parla di se stesso. L'idea di una entità immateriale, il Gnus che tutto ordina, gli piace, e questo probabilmente perché un tale Gnus non potendo essere portatore di contraddizioni come quella esplicitata nell'esempio del 2 ottenuto con operazioni opposte di raddoppio e divisione potrebbe spiegare quella, quella contraddizione la quale non poteva essere più una contraddizione soltanto apparente a questo punto introduce per la prima volta una nozione nuova infatti secondo lui il NUS ha una funzione attiva e nel suo agire non può se non ordinare tutte le cose secondo il modo migliore. 
Ordinare il mondo nel modo migliore è sicuramente una nozione teologica, oltre che teologica, ma partendo dal presupposto così descritto si apre un grande problema, quello di poter sapere cosa sia il meglio e quindi il peggio per ogni cosa. Allora lo scopo della ricerca si sposta, infatti non si tratterebbe più di indagare le cause immediate o anche le cose fisiche del mondo fisico, ma per così dire le cause, la causa immediata le modi morali cioè il meglio per ciascuna e per tutte le cose continuo infatti il solito e dunque pensavo chi voglia trovare la causa di ciascuna cosa e cioè come ogni cosa si genera e perisce ed è questi gli bisognerà trovare di codesta cosa qual è il suo modo migliore di essere o di fare o di subire a che e precedendo in questo ragionamento pensavo che nient'altro convenga all'uomo indagare sia di esso uomo sia delle altre cose se non ciò che è eccellentissimo e ottimo e che necessariamente quelli medesimo che il meglio dovrà conoscere anche il peggio perché una sola e identica è la conoscenza del meglio e del peggio la ricerca del meglio e del peggio è certamente nuova nel panorama della perifissus historia e restano da chiarire i molti problemi della sua applicazione alle cause fisiche concrete però l'idea di una teologia non lo è e le antiche teogonie erano proprio le spiegazioni causali remote dei fenomeni della natura dove le regioni di terra, cielo e mare avevano i loro dei, così come le avevano anche ogni parte del mondo e ogni fenomeno ma proprio il pensiero teologico anteriore era venuto in crisi ad opera della Perit Fissius Historia la quale aveva messo in crisi aveva messo in evidenza le contraddizioni di tale pensiero, come per esempio eh, in Senofra. Ora, tocca a Socrate mettere in evidenza la crisi della nuova ricerca naturalistica. Infatti dice, così ragionando, con grande gioia ritenevo di aver trovato in questo Anassagora chi mi avrebbe spiegato, secondo la mente mia propria, la causa di tutto ciò che è e che egli per questo, per esempio, avrebbe cominciato a dirmi se la terra è piana o rotonda e dettomi questo, mi avrebbe spiegato perché è così e perché non può essere più così, allegando la ragione del meglio e cioè che per essa il meglio era appunto di essere così o così e se poi mi dirà che era nel mezzo, mi chiarirà che per lei il meglio era appunto di essere nel mezzo e se mi dimostrerà questo, allora è dicevo io sono pronto a non desiderare più altre cause di altro genere. Vorrei sottolineare un passaggio qui tradotto secondo la, mia, secondo la mente mia propria, Catanum e Motto. Socrate si aspetta che Anassagora gli insegni qualcosa che vada d'accordo col suo modo di vedere. Cioè la ricerca socratica, anche se orientata teologicamente e teologicamente, rivendica una autonomia di pensiero che non è disposta a cedere al dogmatismo di nessuno, forse anche il più famoso dei saggi. Questa caratteristica socratica, profusamente descritta tanto da Platone quanto dal resto della doxografia, si rende perciò autrice in questo caso di un comportamento intellettuale singolare. Da un lato Socrate mette in evidenza la crisi del pensiero naturalistico mostrandone i limiti e le contraddizioni e dall'altro cerca di superarlo proprio accogliendo e aggiungendovi le forme di pensiero anteriori teologia e teologia arricchite però proprio del metodo della recente perifisio spistolino si deve dunque alla sua convinzione ossia al suo presupposto teologico e teologico il fatto di non aver immaginato che una mente ordinatrice potesse comportarsi in altro modo assegnando a ciascuno il meglio. Il meglio qui svolge proprio il ruolo dell'archè dei tre socratici, e infatti li aggiunge. E quindi pensavo che egli, assegnando a ciascuna cosa individualmente e a tutte collettivamente questa causa, cioè il meglio, anche avrebbe dichiarato qual è l'ottimo per ciascuna e il comune bene per tutti. E queste mie speranze non le avrei date per tutto l'oro del mondo 
e presi con grande sollecitudine quei suoi libri mi misi a leggere con grande con maggiore rapidità perché volevo con la maggiore rapidità conoscere il meglio del peggio conoscere il meglio e il peggio significa conoscere la causa di ciascuna cosa e anche la causa di tutte le cose cioè la causa ultima siamo qui ad un livello di astrazione molto maggiore della teologia tradizionale e sullo stesso livello di astrazione del naturalismo pesocratico. Infatti, per la teologia tradizionale, gli dei sono insondabili, ma per il pensiero naturalista l'ordine del mondo soggiacente a tutti i fenomeni, perché appunto, non è per nulla insondabile, anzi si rivela nella natura e nelle sue funzioni. Socrate allora ripropone un antico modello di pensiero, una fede teologica e teleologica, arricchita innanzitutto dal pensiero naturalistico nella sua immediatezza, cioè le spiegazioni fisiche che egli non rinnega affatto, ma anche dallo stesso modello metodologico che è presentato. Non a caso Socrate parla del meglio ma anche del peggio. Infatti, se nel modello tradizionale le opposizioni sono vissute come entità a sé stanti, ora in conflitto, ora in armonia, per Socrate l'opposizione fra meglio e peggio è soltanto cognitiva, identica alla conoscenza del meglio e del peggio. Il mondo non può non essere organizzato per il meglio, ma proprio per capire come è organizzato bisogna conoscere il meglio e il peggio. Quindi la discussione si sposta sul piano cognitivo, Spetta all'uomo saper capire cosa sono il meglio e il peggio perché soltanto così egli potrà capire l'ordine del mondo. Per questo il metodo che so che presenti come suo, catà nun e mautori, è effettivamente qualcosa che non può trovare pronto, perché è una visione non solo nuova ma molto complessa. Prima di continuare passiamo velocemente, eh, pa possiamo velocemente fare cenno all'unico esempio contemporaneo a Socrate di questa nuova teologia e teologia. La troviamo infatti in Diogene di Apollonia nel frammento di tre. Cito Diogene. In effetti, senza intelligenza, non potrebbe darsi una divisione tale da realizzare la misura di ogni cosa, sia di inverno che d'estate, sia di notte che di giorno, sia di pioggia che di vento e di sereni anche tutte le altre cose, se mai non intende esaminarle, le scoprirà ordinate nel miglior modo possibile. Diogene era contemporaneo di Socrate e forse erano anche amici. In questo frammento si vede come il principio unico, in questo caso l'aria, era portatore di un'intelligenza che dispone tutte le cose secondo il migliore dei modi. Non si sa chi abbia la priorità sull'idea del migliore, se Socrate o Diogene di Apollonia, ma certo è che questa idea comincia a circolare proprio come stanza interna al pensiero presocratico. Infatti, la Perificius Historie, se vogliamo, eh, presentava sì l'esenzione critica richiesta dal fallimento del pensiero religioso anteriore ad essa, ma presentava anche lo svantaggio di non poter rispondere all'esigenza umana di decidere per il meglio. L'operazione di Socrate allora è brillante non solo perché accoglie tanto la tradizione della saggezza antica quanto i nuovi apporti della scienza ionica, ma anche perché, trasponendo sul piano cognitivo la necessità di conoscere il meglio e il peggio, allarga l'ambito della ricerca includendovi la capacità del soggetto cognitivo di riuscire a concepire il meglio e il peggio. Per Socrate la ricerca del meglio e del peggio è sì realizzata nel mondo oggettivo, infatti come dirà più avanti a proposito della spiegazione fisica dello stare seduto, dice che se uno dice senza avere di codeste cose ossa e nervi e tutto quello che io ho non sarei capace di fare quello che mi sembra di dover fare, sta bene, lo studio è vero, fine della citazione. Ma la ricerca deve essere allargata alla nozione soggettiva del meglio, perché l'uomo che conosce il meglio conosce il mondo e conosce il principio ordinatore del tutto, la causa di ciascuna e di tutte le cose. Proprio per questo egli rivendica che la sua spiegazione del fatto di essere seduto lì in prigione non la si deve cercare nelle disposizioni di ossa e muscoli e nervi, ma proprio nella sua decisione di non fuggire, perché essa è la realizzazione del meglio. Solo la conclusione. Mi avvio alla conclusione con un corollario inevitabile. Nel pensiero religioso anteriore il meglio e il peggio sono semplicemente l'adequazione o meno al volere del Dio e anzi 
a volte anche il peggio è il volere di certi dei. In altre parole, il meglio e il peggio sono come che progetti vati nel comportamento supposamente fisso, regolare e predeterminato della natura. Nel pensiero presocratico il meglio e il peggio non sono oggetto di studio perché quei sapienti si dedicavano a studiare la natura e non a giudicarla. Ma ora, con Socrate, nasce lo studio del meglio e del peggio, il quale si rivelerà soprattutto uno studio del meglio e del peggio nell'uomo. Tuttavia, l'ambivalenza di meglio e peggio aprono la strada a una discussione che certamente aiuta a dirimere questioni dubbiose, ma che allo stesso tempo porta al possibile relativismo del meglio e del peggio. Cioè, come si fa a sapere che qualcosa o qualche comportamento siano il migliore o il peggiore? Dato un fatto, come decidere se esso è stato il migliore o il peggiore? Qualunque risposta non potrà essere né precisa né assoluta, perché quasi sempre si riesce a pensare un virtuale migliore e un virtuale peggiore. Come sappiamo, questo virtuale migliore è rappresentato dalle forme. Comunque, la strada aperta da Socrate è la strada, che porta, è la strada che porta alla contingenza del sapere sul mondo e in questo egli non è, non è solo, ma è accompagnato da tutto il movimento sofistico. Tuttavia, le domande di Socrate fanno invecchiare irrimediabilmente le risposte anteriori, sia di Anassagora sia degli altri presocratici. Quelle risposte ora non servono più. Nuove domande pongono nuove sfide alle eterne questioni del mondo. E molte grazie. Grazie professore, eh, la mia domanda è una domanda più lessicale, eh, lei ha parlato di Dio, sì. però secondo me eh, ha come è tolto l'importanza del nus che, che, che appare, cioè non sarebbe meglio andare più sul nus invece di insistere sul una parola che Platone cioè, ha evitato o non ha avuto. Lui decide di abbandonarla perché Anassagora non gli permette di avere il pensiero teologico. Anassagora parla di spiegazioni fisiche. Invece Socrate ha certi presupposti teologici che sono anteriori al pensiero, della, al pensiero naturalistico, cioè i presupposti teologici del pensiero tradizionale e quindi il pensiero tradizionale sono di idee, di genealogia, eccetera, eccetera, cioè la spiegazione del mondo secondo il pensiero omerico e eh, esodico, in questo senso qui. Quindi in questo senso ho parlato delle idee come una maniera di spiegare il mondo anteriore alla, alla, alla novità introdotta dai presocratici. Socrate si eh, critica i presocratici in un certo senso ma lui ha questi presupposti e non, non, non accetta di liberarsi però non se ne libera però non torna indietro unisce il pensiero teologico applicato al metodo della, dei presocratici della condizione di questo libro allora che succede? Che, che il meglio e il peggio che sono dei fenomeni statici nell'organizzazione della natura prima del pensiero presocratico. Il mondo è com'è, buono o brutto che sia, è il volere degli dei. Però adesso questo meglio e peggio, siccome il mondo deve essere organizzato secondo il meglio, il meglio deve essere studiato e per studiarlo bisogna studiare anche il peggio. Per capire le cause bisogna studiare il meglio e il peggio. Allora c'è una, una unione sia del pensiero tradizionale che del pensiero eh, preso e quindi questa è la, mi sembra che sia la novità eh, che so perché porta. E il nus? E il nus? Il nus è... Sarebbe solo fisico, sarebbe solo... 
No, ma per questo io questo ho cercato di spiegarlo, non è so, eh, eh, so perché non si soddisfa, perché non è che il NUS, il NUS eh, non è fisico, ma anche le altre spiegazioni dei presocratici non sono fisiche. L'essere e non essere di Parmenide non è fisico, no? l'aperio non è fisico, ma nemmeno l'aria e l'acqua sono fisici, nel senso che sono spiegazioni soggiacenti all'ordine del mondo, non sono cose fisiche, sono spiegazioni del mondo. Grazie. I want to put a, a hypothesis to you and uh, see how you react to the hypothesis. Uh, you quoted, I think, absolutely right to Diogenes of Apollonia, uh, who talks in terms of the disposition of things post calista um, which is, of course, a, is, is in terms of superlatives, post calista in the best possible way, so that things are disposed in the most beautiful or the best possible way, the stars, the planets, the seasons, and so on, as you said. And then we get to Socrates and Plato. After that, what you might call hard teleology, to what looks like a much softer teleology. Because now, while both Plato and uh, Socrates talk in terms of the best possible, The actual theory of forms is not in the superlative form. In other words, Plato talks about the form of the good, not the form of the best. And in terms of, if you like, pure or hard theology, one would have expected a reference to the form of the best. And then, of course, the argument would go through. I mean, the world is such that everything is disposed in the best possible way, or is avistar. It was a belt and stuff. But it doesn't come out like that. It comes out in terms of straight description rather than superlative description. And I'm just wondering what do you think is going on here? I mean, for example, in the time years, there's a passing phrase which the commentators pass right over and they never worry about and they explain it differently. But the phrase is, hey, idea to beltistu, the form of the best. He only uses the phrase once in the whole of the time years. But I can't help thinking it might have been a temptation that he had, given the nature of, if you like, the best form of teleology, or solid teleology, in terms of superlatives. Just a passing temptation, but an interesting temptation, because it's much closer to what Diogenes of Apollonia first said Pose calista, the superlative form. <coughs> anyway, it's a hypothesis, and I'm interested in your, your view. Io non so se ho capito bene la domanda. È, un, è una questione un po' troppo difficile da affrontare qui, però la questione c'è la questione di come i gradi, e quindi cioè i gradi qualitativi, il più e il meno nella qualità, hanno un riferimento al perfetto. I gradi quantitativi hanno un riferimento all'infinito. Però i gradi qualitativi, se un esempio, il, eh, eh, la bellezza, la migliore bellezza è la bellezza in sé. No? Allora, il qualitativo ha questi gradi che tendono virtualmente alla perfezione, invece il quantitativo tende, i gradi del quantitativo tendono virtualmente all'infinito. Però non posso rispondere alla sua domanda, professore, mi dispiace, e mi toccherà studiare di più questa questione giustamente nel team e in Diogene, perché loro non erano, eh, per loro non era chiara questa, questa distinzione del come i gradi portassero alla perfezione. Cioè Platone è il primo che comincia a parlare di queste questioni. E anche così è difficile, per lui è difficile anche farsi capire, no? Tant'è che per esempio l'esempio si trova in banchetto dove i gradi portano alla perfezione. Quindi il processo del meglio e del peggio, beh, insomma, è più complesso di quello che posso eh, dire. 
time is over. Thank you. Our last speaker is Simon Trepanier. Simon is a lecturer in Classics at the School of History, Classics and Archaeology of the University of Edinburgh. He had his PhD at the University of Toronto under the supervision of Brad Inwood, and he published his research in a very challenging book, Empedocles and Interpretation. He defends an Unitarian reading of Empedocles' thought and work. He also wrote some important papers on Empedocles' theology, on root issues, and he is the author of the item uh, Empedocles in the Oxford Bibliographies Online. He's going to speak on Empedocles in the Fido, Scare Quartz Pythagoreanism. It's at 10.32, uh, but that text, I realized, was much too long and too convoluted, so I decided to just uh, ignore it and concentrate and produce a handout. The handout itself is a bit monstrous. Uh, don't worry, I won't have time in 20 minutes to go through six pages of nine-point font. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'll necessarily be skipping lots, but hopefully it gives you some ammunition for uh, the questions. Um, I'll roughly divide my time between uh, introducing Empedocles. I'll just assume that you know nothing, um, that you are interested, but you're uh, good Platonists and you haven't really read your Empedocles lately, and so what's new. So I'll spend time on that. Uh, and then I think implicitly a lot of the contrasts will be bubbling around in your head anyway. And then in the second half, I'll spend 10 minutes trying to point some of those key ones out, and I hope that'll just lead to a further discussion in the questions where you can uh, uh, exploit uh, your own interests in it. So, um, why Empedocles? So I will follow the order of, of, of the structure. Um, there's no doubt that the uh, Phaedo um, is supposed to be Pythagorean, in a way I call scare quote Pythagoreanism, uh, by which I just mean um, something like a literary tradition. I'm not too worried about getting to the historical phenomenon behind it. Um, what I want to do is follow up on the continuities in the literary tradition we have access to. Um, and so, um, if you read the opening bits, obviously the person that is going to, uh, the, one of the key words that is dropped is the mention of Philoleos. So that already sets up the expectation that things are going to be Pythagorean. If you know a little bit more also about Pythagoreanism, then there's the discussion of catharsis and the thesis that the soul is immortal. So all of this provides a kind of quote-unquote Pythagorean context to it. Um, but if you look at the actual evidence for Philoleus, um, we don't have a lot. It's actually a little bit um, disappointing that way. We can't follow up these continuities. What I want to try to convince you is that there is in fact a lot of Empedocles in the Phaedo, a lot more than we've suspected. Um, and the reason we haven't been able to see these continuities is because his thought in the modern period has been ripped in half uh, and left both sides left on either half of the road, as it were. Uh, so it's not really been possible to see the continuities in his thought. Uh, and uh, the uh, reason for this, and I'll, now I'll transition to just introducing the new Empedocles a little bit, um, the tradition of understanding Empedocles' work divides his works between two titles. So there's a work uh, on nature, Perifuseos, and there's a work called Catharmoi. And this is, if you open your Dios Kranz, this is what you'll find in it. Uh, in fact, this division of labor uh, isn't as clear as it seems, which is to say that although it's, it's what I would say is it's a modern artifact, which is to say people have taken all the physics stuff and put it in one corner and taken all the Catharmoi material. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Perhaps the Platonist and Neoplatonist authors were more interested on the stuff about soul and they selectively quote that as well, so that reinforces this impression. Um, and the problem this creates is what is the status of soul in Empedocles? Because on the one hand you get a kind of 
reductionist physics, and on the other hand, what appears to be a quasi-dualistic scheme of a soul that is, um, but of course, Empedocles, and this is the, the main point, was before Plato. So if there are gonna be some resemblances between the two, who influenced who? Um, and this is a very frustrating conversation I have with Platonists all the time, because people will throw back at me that my argument is circular and I'm using Plato to reconstruct Empedocles. And I just bunk, uh, I mean, unless you can prove that Plato was actually historically prior to Empedocles, I don't think my argument is that circular. So that's, so have, have that. Put that in your pipe and smoke it too. Um, so uh, the main problem is how the soul is going to, what is the status of the soul in Empedocles going to be? So all of this was exploded in 1999 by the publication of the Strasbourg Papyrus of Empedocles. And I've given you Ensemble D, which is the most significant one there. I'll read you, I've given you my edition of the material, which is actually unpublished yet. It is different in some interesting and I hope important respects from uh, the uh, published, so far published editions. I won't go into the details of it because the good stuff is on the right side of the brackets, which is to say that my supplements seek to reinforce what's already there and make better sense of it. Um, but um, the key bit, and I'll just read the translation, he starts at the top, to fall apart from one another and meet their fate, much against their will, and sorry, I'm at the top of page two, um, following under harsh necessity. But all those that already now have love, harpies, the lots of death will not be upon them. Woe that the pitiless day did not destroy me sooner before I plotted deeds with my claws for the sake of food. But now in vain on account of that law I have drenched my cheeks, for we have come to a very deep place, I reckon, and are against our wishes torments will beset our hearts. Okay, the key point comes in lines 5 to 10, where he interrupts what seems to be an account of the origins of life with a, uh, uh, an assertion about his status as a cursed exile from the divine. So this passage is very important because it proves, it doesn't prove that there was one work, I want to be clear about that, but it does prove that there was only one system. Why? Because he's discussing, and all the other passages that we have from this Tasbo Papyrus overlap with bits of the on nature. So the minimal safe conclusion is that the on nature included Pythagorean reincarnation lore. Um, if anything, and I'll just briefly uh, explain this, I think that I've uh, supplied on line uh, D7, now in vain epitode nomo, um, as opposed to earlier ones, and I think that that reference to nomos is uh, an indication that fragment 115, which is this most fundamental fragment about the exile of the daimones, must have occurred earlier in the poem. So this is a reference back to this more important fragment, and um, this uh, fragment 115 tells us about um, himself as an exiled daimon and uh, for whatever sins. And so uh, that's key. So we don't know, understand the details, and this is what I've developed, uh, devoted most of my work to in the last uh, 10, 15 years, is telling a story about how all of it fits together. So now I'll just be dogmatic and tell you a few points that I can support in argument, but I'll just walk you through the picture that we get of a unified Empedocles, and then we can compare that to what we get in the Phaedo, and then hopefully, um, then I'll leave it to you to see what you think as well. So, uh, if Empedocles, in any case, the unity of his thought is not that problematic, because in the passages from the On Nature, he already had gods in his system, they're just natural gods. So if we pick it up at the top of page three, um, we get this formula that he repeats a number of times, uh, and he says, uh, he's talking about the elements, and he says that they are able to generate all things, or all six principles, not just the elements, but the elements in combination with the actions of love and strife, from which all things that ever were, are, or will be hereafter have sprouted, trees and men and women and beasts and birds and fish reared in water, and long-lived gods mightiest in honors. Now, uh, I draw your attention to the idea of long-lived gods. So that's uh, an important proof text, which shows that Empedocles doesn't assume the immortality of gods, why would he have created a new epic formula uh, if he was committed to gods being eternal? He's obviously modified the tradition in a way. Why? The obvious explanation is the cosmic cycle. If there's a cosmic cycle, nothing can last forever. All compounds are only going to be long-lived. And then um, I draw your attention in B to a connection between these long-lived gods and uh, the reincarnated souls of various people, and he says, uh, and in the end they become seers and poets and healers and leaders among earthbound men, 
whence they sprout into gods mightiest in honors. Now, the reuse of the little formula at the end, tibesi feristoi, in both cases, would imply that he's talking about the same gods. So what you do have there in Empedocles is a passage between men and gods. If men can be, or souls reincarnated, souls can become gods, but only law and lived ones, and uh, so on. OK, so um, the closest we get, therefore, in, so I'll, I'll refine those details. Now I'll transition to Plato. Uh, I'll jump right in at the objections of Simeus and Kebis. I'll describe those a little bit, and then I'll try to refine the picture even more, and then compare uh, the, the picture we get of Empedocles with those two objections. The key similarity already is visible, though. Kebis' objection allows for reincarnation. He says, sure, I buy reincarnation. I don't have an issue with that. But I don't see that from reincarnation or just the soul being longer lived in the body, immortality flows from it. And as you all know, the last part, the new methodology, all of the stuff that comes after that in the final proof are all an attempt to prove the out and out immortality of the soul as opposed to its mere longevity, a greater longevity than the body. Um, so now I'm at section two in the middle of page three. Um, so uh, let's just recap some of the other s similarities, but we'll, let's try to refine them. So um, we've already got certain common grounds in the separation of the soul and body as a purification. We get already, even just from Empedocles' own um, alternative title, the separation of the soul from the body in a materialist sense, he seems to call a purification. I'll, I'll refine this in, uh, in more detail. Uh, and we had uh, Francis this paper yesterday, which gave you all the passages. So just get his hand out and you get all the passages with catharsis and purification in it. Um, and then uh, we get the affinity argument, um, which here I just point out, uh, of course, Empedocles can't have made the infinity, uh, the affinity argument, because he's not a Platonist, right? So he can't compare. His soul's not going to be on the map for another 75 years or something like that. So obviously that part has nothing to do with Empedocles. Um, but then we get the harmony theory uh, of uh, Simeus and Kebi's analogy to uh, the lyre. And we get two pictures uh, that are meant to be something of a roadblock to, um, to Socrates' theories advanced so far. Now, the first point I want to make about these, even before we look at Empedocles, is that these two pictures, as Plato himself says, are completely incompatible. They are different theories, but we, often, we tend to lump them together because they're all part of the same thing. But the first one, the harmony theory with the lyre, compares two completely different things. It's meant to account for soul as a perhaps emergent quality of the body, but it has the properties that make the soul like the invisible forms and so on. The second one is a completely different picture. Uh, and in particular, it, uh, Plato doesn't mention this, but now we're reassuming that the soul must be some kind of material thing, because you have a cloak and a cloak maker, uh, and so you have a physical body affecting a, a physical body. Uh, and the only difference is that one is longer lived than the other. Cloaks and cloak makers are obviously physical objects. Now, um, Plato says that the two, soul, the two pictures are completely different, and they're completely different in an, another important platonic respect, is that it's bottom up or top down. The lyre is an attractive image, but Plato rejects it out of hand, and I think through some sleight of hand as well. He pretends it's incompatible with recollection because he hates the idea of the soul being dependent or emergent from the body. As he puts it in the Protagoras, the soul should be the master and the body the slave. Plato's going to have nothing to do with that. The other image is more compatible with what Plato wants to do because he's got um, the, the one being longer living, lasting than the other. OK, so uh, now I want to compare the two images separately with Empedocles and try to refine the picture both of Empedocles and then the compare and contrast the differences with the two thinkers. So um, the best evidence we have for a pre-Socratic harmony theory is Empedocles. We don't have any direct evidence that uh, Philolae, it seems, it seems plausible because he explains everything else in, the, in similar terms, but we do not any, have any direct evidence for Philolaeus calling the soul a harmony. Um, but we do for Empedocles because, uh, as Aristotle quotes, he says, um, De Anima uh, 408, I quote just the second part. Um, the, the key point is, um, but one might put also this question to Empedocles, for he says that each of the, that each of the parts of the body is so by means of a certain ratio. So um, one thing that's interesting here and makes it different from the liar theory already is that um, in Empedocles, 
Um, you'll remember he has the weird account of the origins of life with all the different parts coming together. Um, probably the idea there is that all the different body parts with, which are separate exist prior to the whole. They have different ratios. So they're different compounds with different activities. And so they come together only later through accident and trial and error. And that's a, a whole other paper in its own right. But the upshot of it is, is that modern animals, men, and plants are concatenations of several different harmonias. So it's not like the lyre and the, or if it's like the lyre, it's only qua each part. And the important key difference there is that in Empedocles, if you look at his embryology, what you probably get is an account whereby, I can't go into all of the details maybe during the question, but each of the parts of the soul, uh, each of the parts of the body is generated through reproduction except for the soul. In the, in, in the case of the soul, he doesn't account for the limb. He calls the limbs a combination of parental limbs, which is interesting. But the soul is placed in the body by love. And we'll look at fragment 126, which describes this. So this is an important difference. Plato does more or less the same thing in the Timaeus as well, the important part of the soul. Uh, and that, again, is different from Kebbi's. So there is a similarity. The soul is a compound. Each body, so the soul is a body part among other body parts. It has a different ratio from the other parts, and presumably for reincarnation to be possible, it's more long-lasting. It has a kind of identity that the other limbs and body parts don't have. Um, so that's the difference. So in that respect, it's closer to Kepi's picture. But Plato falsifies the picture, I think, probably on purpose by having just the one ratio. And how, how is it false? Well, let's look at um, the nature of transmigrating soul now. I'll transition to page four. And I'm aware that time is running out. But um, very quickly, uh, I've unearthed the testimony from, uh, that was buried by Deals. He doesn't put in doxographic Reiki, um, but its uh, pedigree is impeccable. Um, and it's with a bunch of other passages that also uh, uh, give correct definitions of soul and even attributes their source to Asia. So it's weird that Deals rejected this. Uh, and it says that according to Empedocles, the soul is a migma, um, and this is the top of ether and fire. So this is his definition of soul. So what this sounds like is an early version of a pneuma theory. Um, and in fact, there's evidence which I have to give at the bottom there that uh, probably what the soul is, is this mixture, and it lives in the blood during life. Now, the doxography, if you study it in detail, I have a whole other paper on this, is consistent that blood is not the soul in Empedocles, but it is the seat of the soul, and the doxography is consistent on this point. Um, and um, this might seem anachronistic. The worry might be that this is a, a later attempt to impose this view on it, um, but there's a passage, and I'll, um, I'll be... Uh, closing because you'll see the connection to the other bit. Um, there is a way of anchoring this doxography in the text, and it's in B9. Um, and Empedocles describes uh, the origins of life, and he says, But they, poide, when mixed ethereal fire, phos ethereum, goes down into a man, or into the race of beasts or bushes, or that of birds, that they call coming into being. And it, when it is separated out, they say it is an accursed fate. Uh, which it is not right for them to say, but I too will assent to the custom. So this passage is traditionally been taken as a correction of ordinary person's mistaken assumptions about generation from nothing into nothing and so on. Uh, it's that, but it's more than that, because it's also correcting this view that, um, that it's a good or a bad thing. I think what's going on in this passage is it's closer to the early bits of the Phaedo where death is a good thing because separation of the soul from the, the body, that is a positive thing. Why is it positive? Because the soul on its own is happier, as it were, than when it's combined in a body. And in particular, and here I I'll, I'll, won't go into all of the details, if I had a whole second part of this paper, the next 20 minutes, I'd be showing you that, in fact, Empedocles seems to assume that we are now in Hades, so that the whole picture of the Phaedo myth that you get in the, in the, at the end of the Phaedo too, I think is a very knowing wink at Empedocles himself. So perhaps this is just also Plato advertising himself being part of the Pythagorean tradition or something like that. Um, but the, uh, the uh, little bit of evidence for it is I just want to point out that in this B9, um, it's notable that the text describes this entering into uh, different bodies by the mixed ethereal stuff 
as a catabasis, so that life is a catabasis in every case. Um, and there are all sorts of other weird passages in Pericles where he makes very pessimistic statements that I think I can give a unitary explanation for, which is that he's consistently being a gloomy Pythagorean describing us as exiled uh, away from the demons. Um, a final little point, and then I'll just leave it to questions. This would also be the best explanation, I think, for B134, uh, the account of the holy frame. And this is, he's describing, apparently, according to our sources, what a god is. Uh, and he says uh, it's not fitted with heads or branches or it doesn't have genitals. It is nothing but a holy and awesome organ of thought soaring through the whole cosmos on swift thoughts. So uh, what this reminds us of, once again, is the ether dwellers of the Phaedo. So I, I've hardly presented any philosophical arguments. I've just tried to outline the general scheme. There are actually some interesting philosophical arguments that perhaps I'll bring up in the questions. But overall, I, I hope to convince you that there's a lot more Empedocles in uh, the Phaedo than you've previously suspected, that there's a lots, lots going on there. And the whole myth itself seems to be a wink back at Empedocles himself. And, uh, seems to place Plato as a kind of successor to Empedocles in the Pythagorean tradition. In a sense, he's shown his continuity by adopting these myths, but in another respect, he's differentiated himself through the immortality of the soul and so on. Okay, uh, there's lots more to talk about, but I'll leave it for the questions. Thank you very much for uh, thank you very much for a very rich and interesting. Uh, I, I'm uh, very much persuaded that there are many empirical uh, echoes here. But uh, you, you, the last uh, point you mentioned, you know, well, since uh, Plato uh, in the Phaedo using such an uh, um, uh, well, important material from Empedocles, that is the all the more Plato is anti. In uh, because you know that's a Sibis and Simias and Kebes uh, objection is uh, as you showed you know firmly based on the Empedocrian thing. That is the point which uh, Socrates really uh, argue against. So <laughs> yes, could you? Could you could yeah, you, I'll refine it. I, he does argue against it. I think it's uh, it's like a it's like an interseminary theological debate. So. Uh, Plato is an heritage tradition in which the soul is only immortal, is only long lived. Why? Because Empedocles has other commitments. To so yes, he wants to supplant him, uh, but he also wants to advertise the continuity. And in particular, one of the things that's weird in, in the myth, uh, the fuller picture is what if the soul is made of fair air and fire? That's why it belongs up there. And there are passages in, in Plutarch which are in your handout which talk about in anachronistic terms that the topos of the soul is kataphusin. And it makes no sense if the soul is immaterial in Plato or if it is or it isn't, but it wouldn't matter where it is in the cosmos. It, it's, it doesn't have, whereas the talk of the pure air make, makes more sense. So, so I think he's, he's, he wants to take up a lot of stuff on, and I think after he's refuted this and changed the position, then he can show some continuity. It's more of a literary tradition. But he is criticizing him, for sure. Yes. That, that's great. Do you think that he is the authentic Pythagorean? <laughs> that's why I call it, that's why I call it scare quote. I think he believes he's continuing a tradition, at least at the literary level. I don't, I don't know what he did in his private life, but... Uh, Thanks a lot for that, Simon. Um, I was just wondering, uh, so the way you depicted it, uh, actually it seemed as if there's more Empedocles in there than, um, strictly speaking, Pythagoreanism or, or Philolaus or so, at least uh, as far as we can reconstruct. And it's just a, a simple question, namely, now we have Philolaus mentioned in Pythagoras' law. Why is that? Is, is the idea that um, Plato uh, really sees him um, as, as a Pythagorean, so, you know, making one hint to Pythagoreans, that's enough. I mean, that would be funny given that uh, Empedocles normally is also seen as at least reacting to Parmenides or so on. So it's not just a Pythagorean um, tradition, right? So um, is, there, is there a good answer yeah. why Empedocles is not mentioned? Yeah, I, I think that, um, I think Empedocles, first of all, the reason why we have Empedocles and not Philodeus <laughs> is that he was readable. He was one of the great literary masterpieces of antiquity, and he's the, you know, he's the influence for Lucretius and so on. So the, 
What's a bit strange is that Empedocles comes off as this sort of bizarre specialist taste now or something like that. But in the ancient world, he was a classic. In the first century AD, people were still copying his text and reading it. Um, so and, uh, Aristotle uses Empedocles, uh, two Aristotle bits to convince the, the doubters if there's any need. If you look in the index Aristotelicum of Bonitz, the most quoted ancient author in Aristotle is number one Plato, number two Empedocles, not Philolaeus, not anybody else. Uh, probably because of his, his encyclopedic range, but but second Aristotelian point is that in the uh, in the Ethics, when he's explaining Acrasia, he uses Empedocles as his example to say, just knowing the words doesn't mean you actually understand what the thing is. Like, you know, I can say E equals MC square, but do I really understand what that means? So the poem itself had to be kind of digested. And uh, as you saw, the, the catabasis bit is full of hints. So I think Empedocles was just a very popular author. It doesn't seem like that now, but he was. He was widely read. Uh, people knew him. And he, if a uh, man in the street had an idea of what Pythagoreanism was, he probably got it from Empedocles. Um, uh, Marwan Rashad has a really good paper on Socrates in the clouds, and what he shows there is that uh, in the first instance, uh, Aristophanes makes uh, Socrates kind of uh, Pythagorean, but how does he do it? All of the language borrowings come from Empedocles. You can see the connections. I mean, uh, Socrates' first word, he's on stage, he's in the basket, he's aerobato, I'm walking on air. That's, 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 that's a kind of connection to this kind of crazy philosophical ideal of living in the clouds and so on. The answer would be, he's not mentioned because he's so popular, everybody had on his mind, rather than like, really sees him as just part of him. Oh, he's mentioned in Plato all over the place. No, um, but, yeah. But here, yeah, I guess. I mean, he, he does a. I mean, he, the amount of stuff that's there almost balances out the mention of, of Anaxagoras, uh, doesn't it? I mean, he mentions him. If you think of the, the all of the myths are probably. I mean, even the Republic, the Cave, uh, as well as the Final Myth. All the myths of judgment seem to be influenced by, or at least mediated by, Empedocles as a representative of this in the in, in the literature of what Pythagoreanism was all about. Um, all I can say is there's abundant evidence that he was he was quite popular. Plato probably doesn't think that much of him as an intellectual, maybe, I don't know. But he thinks maybe he thinks Philolaeus is more hardcore or something like that. But there is abundant evidence that he was popular, that he was read. And in the first century, Lucretius refashions his Epicurean epic after Empedocles. And he's presuming people recognize it, I guess. Why do it otherwise? So, I was uh, I was more convinced by the parallels to Simeus yeah. than to Kepi's, and so I was wondering if so. So Simeus says that the soul is like a harmony, and then oh, and by the way, the, as you know, this is something that we believe. So there's sort of a first stage of the soul is like a harmony. It wouldn't actually have to be a harmony for sort of the first round of objection to work. Yeah. But in fact, we also believe that the soul is a harmony. That sort of whoever the we is there, right? Um, whereas Kebbies is entirely an analogy, I and mean, he doesn't actually think that the soul is a cloak maker. And he says that the argument works whether you think that there's reincarnation or not, right? So either the there, we just have one body, and it's constantly renewing itself, or even if there's reincarnation, maybe the final body eventually dies. So he sort of runs the argument as, you know, take your pick either way, we could still run into a problem. And that seems like it's carefully designed to just attack the affinity argument. So, so why think that we're drawing on the Empedoclean idea that uh, eventually reincarnation's gonna run out uh, there? Why not just think it's designed for the argument? Um, thanks, that's the main question I wanted to address. In the, uh, it's the key philosophical takeaway point of Empedocles is that I would argue that Aristotle didn't invent substance. Substance, the, uh, uh, Aristotle puts the limbs, the body parts, as a candidate for substance in, in the metaphysics. Um, they, uh, they have a physis of their own, which they, can, they, they maintain. So, no, he disarms it in two ways. Imagine that the, the soul is a substance, just for argument's sake. Historically, I'm arguing that it is. It, he doesn't. Even, you can say that it's a harmony. It's a putting together of elements that stays together. Notice that 
it doesn't disarm the recollection argument because if the soul is a separable part, so for the lyre example to work, you distinguish the music or the sound from the instrument that produces it. But if the soul is a detachable part, it's a, it's a material compound that can also do some stuff, it's, it's the actual soul itself that's reincarnated and that would have recollection. There would be no, you know, Plato, I think that that's just Plato playing fast and loose on purpose. He's, because they just say, oh, I really love recollection. I'm never going to give recollection up. So anything that, that is in conflict or that doesn't harmonize, quote, ha, 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 pun intended, with recollection, I'm just going to reject. And so he cuts and dices it. He has it both ways. But the historical, that's what I meant by him. The two images are completely different. But they, they take different aspects. And he's able to reject the harmony theory by having this idea that harmony is an emergent property of the body. But that's not the empedocle position. There might be mind is an emergent property of the brain or the separable frame. Um, but uh, so, so the, the two images, although Plato makes them different, the historical background is actually a little bit closer. What isn't alike is that there is no pre-Socratic or that I know of until Aristotle. The, the idea that the soul makes the body, you get that in parts of animals. In the, in the uh, Timaeus, Plato is explicit that it's the de demiurge who makes the immortal soul and it's placed in it. And in Pedicles in fragment 126, love, she wraps the body in a cloak. And, and it's interesting, even the language is hemation, which is the undergarment, which to me is a kind of topping. The, it's in the blood. Uh, it's in the undergarment of the body. It's not in even. It's not even that. You know. It's even more uh, poetic conceits in Empedocles. Uh, you can roll your eyes all you like. They're there. Uh, he, he just does it all the time. Uh, so I think that the historical position is substance, and he, he can disarm the two by separating them out. And the the historical inaccuracy in the liar account is that Plato is pretending that the harmony is the product of the body. But it's not. It's a product of a body part. And if that body part is separable and reincarnated, you can have recollection. And Pedicles has recollection of some kind as well. The last question. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. Very insightful. So I have a, a small question connected to what you have already said. Uh, I just noticed that uh, in the three examples that Plato used at 73, D5, and then to, uh, before the recollection argument, he used the image of the liar and the clock. So okay. he said, one lover see a liar that beloved is always playing, or a clock he wears, and blah, blah, blah. Also came to mind to idols of the boy the liar belongs to. Yes. So, I know it's very small evidence coming from a literary analogy, but my question, I'm wondering if starting from this, for you, could be an, an insight, um, some meaningful relation between the senior's uh, uh, conception of soul and harmony and the recollection ar argument uh, regarding the connection between physicality and the invisible things. Because as we know, in Simeon's argument, he's speaking about uh, if harmony is still exists when the liar will be destroyed or yeah, destroyed. Yeah. Uh, so also here, say, OK, we, we start from the liar, but then uh, we can attain to idols of the boy. So I, I, I don't know, I was just uh, seeing this analogy of the same example used by well, that, I, guess okay, I, I don't know. All I'll say is think that's a nice literary touch I hadn't noticed, that he's, he's already got his two keywords there. We can do a word search on it and yeah. find the connections uh, between these different parts of the dialogue. Thanks. Thank you very much.